everyone, welcome to the next episode of Between Two Kegs. My name is Zach Fick, and today I have with us Joel Malone. Joel Malone, founder and CEO of Bishop Cider. Welcome, Joel. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. It's something special today with us because, as you might notice, I'm not between two kegs today. I'm between two wine barrels. Cider is not considered a beer. Cider is, in fact, considered a craft like craft beer but it has a different element. And we're gonna go into that today and talk about why cider is booming in this industry and why cider is next to craft beer in the aisles. If you're out in the market and you see your favorite craft beer next to it, and you might even see your cider right next to it because they are considered in the same family of alcohol, but in fact, they are complete opposite and considered the family of how it's made. Beer is made with grain, malt, hops, and yeast. Cider starts with just the apple. So we're gonna go into that. Joel's gonna to start to tell us about how things are done here at Cidercade. In fact, I am at Cidercade. It's a bit loud out here today. But right now, I'd like for Joel to tell a story about how he came about Bishop Cider and where he plans on going with it. Joel. Sure, so yeah, so it was about, oh man, almost a decade ago now that uh, I was home brewing beer and my wife, Laura, uh, drank, drank nothing but cider and naturally you know in the process of making beer it's a pretty labor-intensive process I asked her for help um, and she refused because she does not like uh, beer at all so um, for her we decided hey let's give cider a shot and make cider at home uh, I didn't think I even cared for cider at the time because most of the ciders on the market um, were overly sweet they were solely apple and uh, using a lot of ingredients that I didn't really want to consume, but you know, for her sake, you know, we decided to give it a shot. And I learned very quickly that cider did not have to be anything like what we were finding in the stores. Um, you know, cider can be completely bone dry, like champagne. It can it can be sweet or semi sweet, and also semi dry. And we were adding other flavors and ingredients and herbs and botanicals to it. So the cider that we were making was super diverse on the spectrum and the stuff in the stores was so limited and it was the worst of what I thought cider could be. So for that reason, we decided to, uh, to give it a shot. So we quickly actually emptied our pantry out. Um, all of our food and everything was on our kitchen counters and we put 60, I'm sorry, 30 half gallon tanks in, in our pantry and we were making 30 batches every month. Um, so to learn very rapidly. And then yeah, about the beginning of 2012, we, we secured our first facility in, in the Bishop Arts District. Uh, and you know the rest is history. And let's talk about that. You know, I've come to find that Bishop Arts is a, is an iconic town, mm -hmm. iconic little venue of Dallas. It's yeah. kind of its own little world down there. Uh, and uh, you have a tasting room there, and that's where it all began. A small tasting room. I mean, there's only not just but a handful of chairs in there. Yeah, yeah. We we managed to cram a few more in recently, but yeah, for the longest time, it was only 16 chairs in there and four tables. Uh, it's 704 square feet. But we did all of our production there um, from from the time we opened for about a year and a half before we got our second facility. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was very, very limited, for sure. Well, before I go into your rapid growth from 2014 starting there to 2015, one year later, moving into a 17,000 square foot facility, which is where we're at right now, let's talk about cider. Cider is something special, what I think. It's, it's special in its unique way because, for starters, it's gluten-free. Mm -hmm. Over the last 10 years, there's been a huge movement on gluten-free. People that are gluten intolerant to salic disease, you know, they're finding it's better, better healthy for them. Yeah. They're able to lose weight. They're feeling better about themselves. Sure. And if we can contribute that into an alcoholic beverage, all the better. And on top of that, it's vegan as yeah. well. So all, all of ours are vegan. Uh, a lot of ciders out there aren't. Um, some have add honey, or they might use fining agents that have some animal byproducts in it, but all of our stuff is, we make sure it's all gluten-free and vegan-friendly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a beverage that I feel like um, crosses, it, it's more of a universal beverage, and it crosses the gender gap, um, even, like unlike beer that's heavily um, consumed by men, uh, more so than women. Cider is actually one that's 50-50 men and women, uh, if you look at the demographics of who's actually drinking it. And what's even more interesting about that one, because a lot of people think it's mainly consumed by women, 60% of cider is consumed by men, 
because men tend to drink more than women. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's actually you know, more of a universal beverage when you think about the fact that it's a 50-50 gender gap. Um, so it can be, it can be enjoyed, enjoyed by almost anybody, especially once they realize the diversity of cider and that you know, a lot of people will drink one cider and they may think they don't like cider, but that's like having one beer. Like, it's like, okay, what'd you have? You have a, you have a stout, you have a light lager, what'd you, you know? I mean, there's, there's so many options out there that you know, people really need to explore what all it has to offer before they write things off. So, uh, Joe, let's talk a little about your uh, ciders you've got. You've got several in cans right now. I've seen them all across the market. You've got a great distributor sending them across the state of Texas. I'm sure at one point you might continue to carry your craft across the state of Texas. Uh, what's some of your leading brands? What was your first beer, your first cider, I should say? And what was your second and third, and what right now is your most popular? Yeah, so when we opened our doors um, in May of 2014, we started our first batches, and we unveiled those at our great opening party in July of 2014. And as I mentioned, our place was 704 square feet. Uh, we had 2,000 people show up, so it was nuts. But everything we made in the first two months, we sold out of that day. And that day we did, um, you know, we introduced ciders that were very different right off the bat. We had, we had Suicider, which was a spiced apple cider with cinnamon, allspice, and clove. Then we had, a, we had one called Sideways that we still do our Sideways series, which are our hop ciders. Uh, that one had Cascade in it at the time. And then we did one called Cat Scratch Fever that was actually jalapeno and catnip. So, um, all, all Wait, pretty did interesting. Wait, you say catnip? Oh yeah. Yep. Catnip. Uh-huh. You've heard it here first, catnip. It's an herb. You can go buy it at Central Market, Whole Foods and stuff. Um, a lot of people make tea. It's Oh, it's um, great. My cat, yeah. well, yeah. God rest his soul, but uh, loved catnip and would roll around in it and run around town. And of course, it's uh, you know it's an herb for, uh, well, we'll go into that in another discussion, but it's a great herb. A lot of people use it like a, it's usually in the category of like their sleepy time teas. Like one of those people drink, it has the calming effect to help them help them sleep. So a slightly different effect than what it does to cats, but um, but yeah, so that's what we started with. Um, and we kept releasing different ciders. And not longer after that, we unveiled uh, Crackberry, which was a cranberry and blackberry cider, which has become our, our flagship brand since then. You know, the last 10 years, I've, I've been blessed to be in the craft industry. And I've seen, as we all have, the largest boom in Texas in the craft industry. Yeah. I'm talking not just craft beer or craft cider, I'm talking craft food, I'm talking sure. craft cocktails. You opened up right in the beginning, I should say right after the beginning of the boom of craft beer. Mm -hmm. Has that propelled your business to do tenfold maybe what you ever thought it, you'd ever become? So it, it was a good time for that because people have been more open to exploring different foods and different beverages and, and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely the right time. And we saw craft craft breweries try in early 2000s and 90s and 80s and stuff and just they couldn't succeed. The market uh, wasn't ready for them. So it was, the timing, the timing was perfect. Um, you know, we would have been even further along if it didn't take us 26 months to open our original location. But, um, but yeah, I mean, Dallas has been super supportive of us. Um, and, you know, we're going to keep making as much as we can as long as people keep drinking it. Well, I don't find that a problem. People yeah. tend to love your drink. People tend to love your thing. And you're, and you're coming out with a whole new line right yeah. now. Can you tell me about the, this next line that you're having? It's, it seems to be more in the uh, wine uh, facility, exactly. wine district. Yeah, so um, this is actually created by four women internally um, that wanted to create a product, uh, and it was something they were making here and we were consuming here and started selling it on tap at the Cidercade. And um, so we ultimately, about six months ago, decided to, to roll it out uh, to the market. And it's a, it's a line of canned wine. It's called Uncommon Wine. Um, they call it Unco. And uh, it's four different wines as of now. And we really innovated on, on, on packaging in regards to the fact that it's all in, it's all in cans. Uh, we in innovated in regards to um, the ABV, so everything is like a little under 7%, they're all 6.9%. So now, you know, the person drinking wine versus people drinking beer um, don't have to get their four to six ounce pour while someone else gets to drink a pint. They can actually, they can do the same. Um, so you'll often see this on tap as well um, around Texas here in the next couple weeks. And 
uh, at that point you will get into 12 to 16 ounce pours. So, so innovative on packaging, ABV, and also, you know, we did what is kind of a faux pas in the wine world, but we don't really care what they think, and that's that we added adjuncts to it. So our, our Cabernet has tart cherries and blood oranges in it. Uh, our Chardonnay, Chardonnay has blackberries. Uh, our Pinot Grigio has pineapple and passion fruit, so it's very, very tropical. And then our, our Rosé actually has elderflower in it. So typically in the wine world, they don't want you to add anything to it, but hey, we make what we want to drink, so we don't really care. Well, I'm excited to see those in the market. Uh, and I think the entire uh, craft lover of cider is excited to see that in the market, to see craft wine in the market, in the can. Uh, it sounds something that's ready to uh, explode in the uh, Bishop Arts, the Bishop Cider world. Um, now, let's go back to your uh, website. You know, I went to your website a couple days ago, which is a fantastic one. You have a really good energy with all of your staff. You explain uh, each individual that works here, what they do and how they're a part of this whole, uh, this whole world that you have created. But I scrolled down and I noticed that you can actually order your beverage and have it shipped directly to your house. And that was mind blowing. I'm thinking how in the world can I literally click on Crackberry and have a case delivered to me dire directly to my door? Can you please tell me what and how in the hell you're doing that? Sure, sure. So, um, so kind of back to where you started. Um, that that cider is um, it's very different in, in how it's created. It, you know, compared to beer, you know, cider is apple based. So we're, we are legally a winery. So anything that is uh, have a base of, of fruit juice is considered wine uh, as far as TABC and TTB. So as a winery, we're legally allowed to um, do a lot of things that breweries can't. So we've always been allowed to sell for on-premise and off-premise, um, but you can also ship wine. So uh, on our website, yeah, people are able to, to buy the cider and buy the wine and have it shipped to them. And I think we're currently shipping to about 40 different states uh, around the country right now. So that happened a lot actually when we released our most recent cider. Which was, which was the dark side, you know, obviously Star Wars themed cider. Uh, it's a black currant cider. Um, and whenever we released that one, and we had a lot of orders coming in from California, of people buying it and shipping it out there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's pretty cool that there's been a lot less lobbying by the distributors in Texas um, against wineries. It's been a lot more against breweries. So, you know, we've kind of been able to skate by without having a lot of the legal hurdles that breweries have. So yeah, it's, a, it's another pretty cool aspect, but it's one that still surprises people that they can come in like to our facilities, drink on site, and they can take a six pack to go when they leave. Like it's not, it's not what we're used to in Texas, like being able to take a six pack at the bar you've been drinking at. So, um, so there's a little bit of a learning curve in that regard as well. Well, speaking of learning curve, uh, you know, if you're a Star Wars fan and you're actually a fan of the dark side, uh, you better well, appreciate it because this guy's got a patent a name called the dark side and it sounds like it's a one hell of a drink to enjoy uh with um uh, with your friends and family now start start let's go into uh, pairings what does cider pair with so you know i've been in the beer industry long enough to know what you know an ale does what the lager does sure. with this dark or stout porter you know you name it you name it it goes it goes well with this drink goes well with this food and this forth can you tell me a little bit about what a cider might pair well with on the food food end sure so uh, a lot of it's going to depend on the flavor profile Our, ours differ so drastically um, but typically if you're going to go with something more like a more like a, a, a nice fish dish, you're gonna want a drier cider or something like that. But a lot of my favorites are more with Asian food because uh, it just pairs very well with like, like Thai food, for example, a, a semi-sweet or a sweet cider. Um, but also they're, they're great to cook with. So a lot of people will marinate stuff with our ciders or they'll do reductions with our ciders uh, and even make um, like almost like a, a topping for like a dessert, like luck and does it um, every once in a while with some of their dessert cakes. We'll make a reduction with Crackberry and put it on there. Um, I mean, another cool thing that adds to the versatility of cider is that you can even heat it up in, when it's cold outside. So, uh, like our Suicider cider, that's currently not in cans, but it's a, it's a spice cider that we make, um, is one that a lot of people would heat up on the stove, add a cinnamon stick to it, uh, and drink hot. So, 
Actually, that's going to be our, our Q4 seasonal this year is actually a wassail that we're doing that with. So on the can, it'll have instructions on how to heat it up on the stove. Um, and, you know, it, it, can, it can be served hot. So, um, and, and that's, that's funny because we're actually talking about hard cider here. When I say cider, cider is non-alcoholic. However, hard cider is alcoholic, so. Yeah, and that's something that everyone debates on because like in, in Europe, they don't ever use the word hard. Like, they have apple juice and they have cider, and cider's the hard stuff. But in America, we had apple juice so long before that it was just like, they were, they were so different that everyone has to stipulate that it's a hard cider versus regular cider. Um, and yeah, so it's, it, there's a lot of that old, old world, new world stuff, because it's similar to our fruit. Um, in Europe, all cider is made with um, what they would call cider apples. They're very, very tart, very, very acidic. And unfortunately, those just aren't grown in America yet. So, you know, we had that issue when we started of, well, are we gonna use cider apples and import them, or would we rather stick to what's grown domestically and support our domestic crop and farmers? And, and that's the route we decided to go. So all of our fruit is sourced domestically. Um, all of our apples come out of the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, um, and even our other fruits, like our cranberry and blackberry, is all domestic as well. So, uh, but yeah, so the apples that we currently use would technically be considered dessert apples or eating apples. They're, they're similar to what you find at the store because uh, that's what's grown in America. So as more cider companies grow and are introduced in America and you know it's, it's been a recent resurgence in America, I think that a lot more farmers will invest more heavily into traditional cider apples, uh, which will be very beneficial. I mean, we would, we'd pay 10 times the price per gallon if someone had that available here. Uh, so I think more people will invest that, that direction and then we'll, we'll get a lot more drier ciders uh, with a lot more tannins, a lot more acidity. Um, but as of now, um, we're, we're a little more limited on the fruit in America, but you know, it was important to us. Um, with about 70% of the apple crop in, in the world grown in China, uh, we just we want to stick to, stick to what, what's grown here. Well, it sounds like, Joel, we can go on and on about how cider's made and, and the growth of cider and, and, and so on and so on, but I really would like to see the back of your house. And it's funny that I'm standing behind about 15 or 20 video arcade games. There's in fact over 150 Arcadia games in this facility called Cidercade. And we're gonna go and view that here in a short while. But before we do that, would you show us on how some of your product is made, show us some of the equipment and how you interpret this apple or this fruit into this can or into this, into this beverage. Can you yeah, do that for us? Let's do it. All right. Yeah. So now that Joel and I have a full can of cider, we're going to walk around his cider house and get a good idea on how all of this is made. Cider. What do you want to do? Yeah. All right. Let's cider. So I mentioned that we um, source all of our apples from Washington, Oregon. So what happens is apple harvest is actually really short. It's, it's pretty much October of every year. And I've got a good supplier that will take those apples that harvest every year and freeze them for us. So when we place our order for juice, they're pulling those apples out of the freezer, pressing it, juicing it, and then sending it down here to us. So the first thing we do is we take the juice and we fill our fermentation tanks. So those are all the tallest tanks in this room. Uh, I think we've got 15 of them right now. Mm -hmm. They're all considered 70 barrel fermenters. So they're 2,146 gallons a piece. So we, we fill those up and then we will add our, our house yeast to it. Uh, it's a yeast that was actually designed for white wines. So it leaves a lot of apple character and aroma. Um, and, but at the same time, it actually completely dries out the product. So it's bone dry at that point. And it ferments pretty quickly in about a week and a half. Uh, and so whenever it's completely done fermenting, what you'd have in these tanks would be considered apple wine. So it's, it's bone dry, all of the carbonation that's developed during fermentation comes out through the top through an airlock. So it's also completely still. So it'd just be like, it'd just be like a, a white wine you've had that has no bubbles. Um, and at that point, what we will do is we'll actually filter it through our filtration system here. This is a, a crossflow filter. The cool thing about it is it actually eliminates everything from it. All bacteria, yeast, anything. Um, so it's crystal clear after it goes through here. And we'll filter it through our bright tanks that we have over here. And these two bright tanks we've got, so we've got a 30 barrel and a 45, so they're 1,000 gallons and 1,500, respectively. And that's where more of the magic even happens um, to our specific recipes. Okay. So 
Uh, Crackberry, for example, our flagship brand, that's where we add our cranberry and blackberry and blend it all together. Uh, apple pineapple, we add our pineapple in there. Um, Texas tea, this new brand we're actually about to launch, I'm holding right here. Um, and that's being canned right now. It is actually. We're yeah, going to go see that can. We're going to see it in a few minutes. Yeah, canned for the first time today. Okay. So um, that's where we actually add we add black tea in there. So we actually almost do like a cold brew process. We steep it on black tea, the cider, and then we will also add um, add some lemon to it as well. So it's basically just apples, lemons, and black tea. So, so you know there are so a lot before, of alcoholic teas out there, but they're FMBs that are nasty. Before we go into this any further, yeah. I always like to ask that million dollar question. When does the juice become alcohol? When the fermentation process. So I always, you know, in the beer industry, the yeast eats the sugars and everything's magically made up from there. How is cider different from that? And when is cider considered alcohol? Sure, so as far as the fermentation, in that regard, it's very similar. So we don't get the sugar from the grain. Instead, we're getting it from the fruit naturally. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so in the fermentation tanks, you know, that sugar will consume, or the yeast will consume all that sugar, and yeah, it'll ferment, um, and it, it goes nuts pretty quickly. But uh, a lot of times on our tours, what we try to do is allow people to try it beforehand so they can try our straight juice, and we'll even find a tank that's in the middle of fermentation and the one that's done, mm -hmm. so they can kind of realize that progression, and they can taste the dryness as it goes through. Um, and they can they can detect if there's any sugar left also, so it's pretty cool. So are we talking days, weeks, you know? About how, 10 days. About 10 days? About 7 to 10 days, for, yeah. So for a batch? Pretty fast, yeah. So then it's a matter of how long we want to let it sit for an age in those tanks before okay. we end up using it for processing. Well, now that we've been into your fermentation house yeah. and your uh, your uh, uh, other cellar, your cellar house, yeah. show us your, uh, your candy line. Let's do it. So yeah, as I mentioned, they're canning Texas tea for the first time today. So um, that's what they're running through up here today. So yeah, it's apple, peas, and lemons. Some Texas tea. Yep, Texas tea. So um, one thing I felt like, I won't name names, but some tea companies out there, FMB companies, have ruined what an alcoholic tea could actually be um, for the market. And all the ones out there are usually fermented corn sugar or something nasty. So, um, and the nutrition facts are horrible too. So we're doing a, we're changing that up drastically with this one. Um, but soon we'll be releasing nutrition facts on this as well. And uh, we think people are gonna be pretty excited about it. It's, it's one of our top three selling ciders currently at the Cider Cane location as well. Right, let's give a shout out to uh, Wild Goose Candy Wine. They're based out of Boulder, Colorado. I've known them for quite some time. They've done great things in the craft industry. They have developed some amazing products that have survived and saved so many breweries and helped get their beer across their markets. Just a big shout out to them. Love them to death. Alexis and the team over in Boulder, Colorado. Cheers to you. It's been an awesome line. We've probably run five to six million cans on it in the last two and a half years. And yeah, we love it. Good. Uh, but yeah, as you see, as the cans come off the end of the line over there, we're going down a little slide into our factorization tunnel. If we can show you all back around on this side. So this piece of equipment will actually take the completed finished seamed cans and they will run down a long conveyor belt through this unit, about 35 feet long. And what happens is we spray hot water on top of the cans and that will heat up the can and it'll literally pasteurize and kill all the yeast that's inside the can so that it, it remains, every drop remains as good as we intended for it to, like years down the road. So it adds a much, long, much longer shelf life to the product um, and it, it extends the freshness of it. So okay. um, I want to do an experiment here. So excuse me, yeah. Joel. I'm going to grab your can right off the line that was just filled. This was just filled just one second ago. We're going to carry it over into this over here. It's nice and cold. Feels good. So I've got this cold can in my hand. I'm going to set it down. A little and I'm going to grab this one. <laughs> this is a hot can. Hot, hot apple. Hot potato. Can you tell me what the importance is and why? 
you go from cold can to hot can in under a few minutes. Yes. Yeah, so, I can't hold it. Well, yeah, it, it's toasted. So what that allows us to do is, um, and if you're more long, long-term goals is to eliminate a lot of the things that people don't want in their beverages. So um, sulfites are something, a, a preservative that's used in pretty much all cider and wines you find on the market, and we're working to to get away from doing that. So we're, we're talking to the government about getting um, special notations on our cans to the state that ours actually doesn't have that in there. So we are, our top priority here is only putting ingredients in our product that are necessary and that people want to consume. So you, you won't find any added sugars in any of our ciders. Uh, you won't add any, see any coloring agents. Um, one of the most common things you see in cider is apple essence. I don't know why they can't just add apple. Why do you have to have the essence of apple? I don't know. But there's just, you know, a lot of ciders you'll look at and the ingredient list will be 20 or 30 long when I'm like, it could be two or three. So uh, we, you know, we only want to give people what they want to be consuming and, and use the best ingredients possible. So that, that's going to allow us to not use like sulfites as an example. Uh, and some other people will use other chemical preservatives in, in their ciders. So we don't want to use anything like that. So. Instead, we invest heavily in equipment like this. Science, science is important in anything. Especially Bill Nye. right here. Yeah. So, anything else? We've got uh, a whole plethora of cans that are ready to go out to the market, right? Yep. Oh, we can we can definitely show Mango Habanero. So this is our Q1 seasonal that is going out right now. Uh, it's a, it was. And these are warm. Our, yeah, they're definitely warm. This is our number three cider on tap here, and we we use. Um, the sales of our ciders on tap at our facility. So whatever consumers come in and buy, that's all that we determine what we put in cans. So it's, you know, you're, you're voting with your dollars for sure. But yeah, this is our Q1 seasonal. It's a mango habanero cider. It definitely has a little bit of heat to it. Um, so we didn't go subtle on the habanero because that's how we like it. But, um, and then Q2 is actually going to be a, a, it's called main squeeze. It's a lemonade cider. So, um, you know, and we did the tea now. We're doing the lemonade then and people will be able to do um, almost like an Arnold Palmer kind of thing, mixing the two, so be pretty fun. It's a pretty fun process here. There's so much omitted from the beer industry. There's no brew house, there's no brew deck. It just goes straight to fermentation tanks. Yep. Quite fascinating and a quite growing market. And I'm pretty excited to have you and have the show become a part of this today because this is something that's gonna be growing month after month, year after year. Yeah, I mean, it's awesome. I and mean, we, 2018, we did nearly half a million gallons of, of cider. So uh, we're excited to, you know, see, see what we can do in 2019. So, okay. Yeah. All right. So. Well, now that we've seen your, your uh, cider house, can you show me your cider cake? Let's do it. Let's go All back right. up front. Okay, so now we've seen the cider house. How about the cider cake? This place is ridiculous. There's skeet ball. There's games that are from the 1970s and beyond. We're gonna go inside and see all these games from pinball machines from the 80s or the 70s and 60s, who knows? Yeah, we've got over 170 arcade games here within the Cidercade. I mean, look at this. This is unbelievable. I don't ever see this anymore in this world today. We don't get this Pinball's opportunity. An example. We have the largest selection of anyone in North Texas. And the best part about the Cidercade, though, it's $10 to get in and all the games are free to play. So $10 no to get need in, for quarters. No quarters, no, no tokens. And it's a little more adult focused. Kids are welcome in the day, but it is 21 and up starting at 8 p.m. Do I get coupons so I can win a free eracer or something like that? Unfortunately not. Yeah, I, good. I don't have to go David Buses for that. And get a couple bouncy balls too. So I'm looking at games. You know, I was born in the 70s. So uh -huh. I'm looking at games that I loved back then and they're here. Yep. How did you get this? How did this all become about? Yeah, so whenever we opened this location, initially this was just our tasting room. It was tables and chairs. We actually did live music in this corner. We had a stage and everything. And I just ultimately decided I want to do something different, offer something different than anyone else. Um, and I was kind of tired of tasting rooms that just had tables and chairs in them. So I wanted to add a much better form of entertainment. So, um, so yeah, we so decided to convert it over. Cake. Yeah, so it was initially just this front room, and we've actually gone through three different expansions because. We just keep hitting max occupancy, so we're trying to, we're, I think we're officially completely out of room now, but yeah, it's, it's been awesome. So in the front of the house, uh, you've got over 24, 25 taps. My yep. 
If I'm yeah, correct. we've got 24 cider taps and we have okay. another six wine taps. So okay. we've got 30 total ciders and wines on tap. There's no beer or liquor here. Um, so it's, yeah, you, you won't find a selection of, of cider anywhere else similar to what we've got here. All right. And so that's kind of where it all begins. What people, you kind of find out what the market wants, what sells, what exactly. doesn't sell, and then what eventually goes in the cans and goes in the market. Can we go look at that uh, tap Let's room? Do it. Let's go. Check Let's it out. Yeah. All right. So yeah, it's kind of the place that people can preview what they might ultimately have in the market. So Dark Side, for example, you know, had a lot of popularity, and it was one that it was our it was our top seller for the last few months before we decided to put it into cans. Hi, Megan. Say hello to the world. Hi. Hello, world. Uh, okay, so you've got all 24 on tap. This is uh, this is a list of everything that you've got carried on. Yep. And. Uh, you get $10 to get in, play all you want, and then you can just buy your ciders at free will. Exactly, yep. Uh, yeah, and our, our cider makers have a lot of a lot of flexibility in making whatever sounds good to them. I mean, so you've got anything on the board from, right now we've got a horchata cider. Um, you know, I mean, it's all over the board, so you, you won't find anything anything like this selection anywhere else. Okay, what the hell is horchata cider? Then you got to try it. That's, that's the beauty of it. Okay. Some of the names we intentionally leave. Could you pour so me a little horchata laugh. cider? And uh, is horchata like this fruit from uh, you know some third world country or something? What's going on here? A horchata? So, you want to explain it to him? Yeah, so it's going to be kind of a, a creamy cinnamon cider. Okay. Yeah. I'm in. Creamy cinnamon. Being it's the holidays, nice and wintery out. This is perfect time for that. 32 degrees outside or whatever it is mm. today. I taste both the cream and the cinnamon. This is very nice. Thank you. Okay, so we've seen quite a bit. You showed me about the brew house. You showed me the cider keg. You talked about your place. You talked about the history from when you went and you and your wife were brewing in your own kitchen. Can we finish off and play a game together? Let's do it. Yeah, I think we've done enough talking. All right, no shit. Let's do that. Which game can we play? I think we stick to more. It's better for like more in the middle room. I mean, it is like almost Christmas time. You can stick to Die Hard. Right? Let's, <laughs> let's do Die Hard. Die, there's a game called Die Hard? Yes, How did I not was. know this? All right, Die Hard. So that's great it's about all of your games. You've got almost uh, cup holders everywhere, oh, yeah. right? For sure. So two player. All right, Joel, well, thank you very, so much for enjoying me Absolutely. and bringing me on board today. Sure. I had a great time talking to you. Hopefully. And we can get some more people to your place and uh, a few more people know about cider and how it's made and the goodness and the greatness about where it's going and what it's going to do. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, for sure. All We've right. We've done enough talking now, right? Yeah, there we're we go. good. That's it. Celebrate Christmas and some Die Hard. Yeah. Dude, I'm distracted over here. This is fucking fine, man. I know. 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 I